the potential EU China trade war. This is one of the most talked about issues last week in China. It began something like this, okay? EU wants to impose tariff on Chinese electric vehicle. Uh, started with EU complaining about all kinds of Chinese unethical business practices, unfair competition, insists on putting tariff on Chinese EV. After that, um, the Chinese government representatives actually approached the EU representative and made an offer. The offer goes something like this, okay? For example, if our cheapest car to Europe right now is 15,000 euro, uh, let's assume that, okay? How about instead of you testing our products, we will increase our product price to a minimum of 30 or 35,000 euros. That way, our cheapest EV will be roughly about the same price to your cheapest EV, and we can compete that way and avoid putting tariff on our vehicle and then I have to retaliate and put tariff on your product and we'll have a trade war. This way we can, you know, try to avoid a trade war, right? Well, some Chinese thought that was a good idea. Uh, however, European Union still end up turning down the offer and put tariff on the Chinese EV anyways. So what EU insists is that the tariff need to be added evenly at all price range. Okay, so if China tries to sell a uh, 15,000 euro EV to Europe, it needs to add, you know, 50 or 100,000 percent tariff, whatever, uh, you know, EU at the end decided to do. And if China sells something like a 50,000 uh, dollar EV to Europe, then you need to bump up the price even more, the tariff to be adding together up to, you know, 100,000. So you cannot just set a minimum price. So you end up placing the tariff, unfortunately, on Chinese uh, EV. And China right now is retaliating by imposing its own tariff on European imports. And well, it's temporary and hope we can solve the problem in the future. I know there's a lot of politics at play here, but even if we ignore the politics, uh, do people really understand what's going on here? Because it is extremely difficult to truly understand the whole picture okay because if you are not able to understand the full picture it is very easy to fall for reasons like china stole all our technologies the chinese workers stole all of our jobs and china has over capacity and so on also you know things like slave laborers they use slave laborers to pick the cottons in xinjiang and the Americans, you know, immediately relates that to their pre-Civil War era on the Southern Plantation, and that triggers a lot of tension, right? Well, today I'm going to give you guys a video from Professor Wan here. I featured him a few months ago. He is going to bring up some counter arguments, okay, to the West regarding to the trade issue. Let's see how you guys take it. When I was traveling in Spain, there was no place to go for breakfast. A restaurant and cafe won't open until 9. And then the restaurant closed at 12 at noon and won't open again until 5 p.m. In France, the combined holiday and employee vacation add up to close to 150 days of days off. 150 days. Can you imagine that? Even under this kind of relaxing environment, the people are still complaining about salary and benefits and whole worker union strikes. How is it possible to be competitive under this kind of circumstances? I'm sorry to inform my Chinese audience here today that you were born in a country with high population density. If you don't work hard, you won't be able to afford many things you currently enjoy. Europeans are different. They have conquered many continents over the centuries and they have accumulated enough capital to afford their lifestyle. If any of my Chinese audience today who want to become a politician in Europe, during your election campaign, you must make the following promises to your voters. Please vote for me. I will give you guys higher social benefits and less working hours. 
if you do not say that, if you instead tell your voters the reality of Europe today, we Europeans are enjoying too much benefits. We cannot afford it. We have to reduce our vacation, cut down on our benefits, get your ass up early in the morning and start working in a factory so we can re-industrialize our economy. If you say those things to your voters, they will kick you out of your office and you will never get elected again. This entire European system currently is a system that will drive up debt. If you look at European system, especially the Scandinavian countries, in which they are considered to be a high tax, high social benefits society, they can achieve and maintain that level of standard of living plus benefit because they are low population density countries. They have less mouth to feed. In addition, they have many natural resources per capita, minerals and oils, for example. They can sustain such high level of benefits. In contracts, if you look at countries like China or in East Asia or South Asian countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, for example, those countries have very little natural resource in relation to their huge population. Many of these countries run a constant trade deficit because they have to import many things, including energy and food. I want to ask my audience, if these countries blindly copy and paste Western social management system, brought in all those laws and regulations to try to boost its own population, social benefits and standard of living, how can they sustain such spending structure? So almost all of these developing countries in the global south, if we just follow the lead of our colonial master's governance system, you are doomed to fail. Especially if you look closer, for example, Latin America, which is rich in natural resources, many of the biggest resource deposits are actually controlled by Western corporate oligarchy. The fattest part of the meat has already been taken out. What can those countries use to run a so-called high social benefit system? This is why the US hate Venezuela so much, because ex-president Hugo Chavez took back 70% of the oil sovereignty that was controlled by Western oligarchy. Of course, nationalizing the oil resources does not automatically mean that the people will be better off. Many developing countries are plagued with corrupt government and politicians and they might not fully utilize the resources to their own advantage. But it is often still better than letting foreign nations take full control of your resources. If you look at Europe today, it is stuck in a downward cycle. It is like a man with his two arms cut off. Not only their industry has moved out of their countries, in which you can consider it to be one of their arm, but many of them also lost their financial monetary sovereignty as well. They do not have their own currency. They cannot devalue their own currency to improve their competitiveness. That's their second arm being cut off. So they are like a man without his two working arm. Just ahead, the government, and the oversized body, a huge middle class, which demands standard of living, but unable to find ways to sustain that standard of living, like a huge fat body. So the only way for them is to take on more debt. Let me be honest with everybody. I'm a scholar. In my heart, I embrace freedom, democracy, equality. I'm against none of those values. The tragedy is that I'm also an economist. I have to keep check and balance. When I do the math, I just cannot figure out a way to make that kind of society work in China, at least not today's China. Europe was able to sustain that due to their high level of development and productivity in the past. Now they're losing both. If they insist on maintaining that system, they will face certain bankruptcy. 
Okay, that was Professor Wan's argument. But I want to first take a look at this eerie tariff thing. And I will tell you guys my take on it, okay? In the short term, it is bad for customer, for sure, since they are forced to reject a high-value product. It is good for local business uh, because they have more breathing space now against highly competitive Chinese products. In the midterm and long term, however, well, it depends, okay? Can European EV products eventually catch up to the Chinese? Um, given the current political and business environment, unlikely. I will say unlikely. You see, the question I have for not just my European audience, but for my global audience, okay? It doesn't matter where you're from whether you're from Collective West or Global South. Today's Chinese manufacturing output, or let's say production output, um, not including the surface sector, exceed the rest of the Global South combined. Okay? And if you look at the world history, almost every country in the world has a head start versus China. How did that happen? You have to ask yourself. Because without knowing China's advantage, or some haters would like to say the Chinese dirty little secret or tricks, right? How can you hope to surpass China? And if European EV makers do not catch up to China and just hide behind the tariff war, then how do you compete outside of Europe? Can you force Africa uh, Asia or not Latin America, or to push back against Chinese EV or at tariff as well. If not, then how do you compete with Chinese EV or Chinese product in general in other markets? And this is not just in the EV market, but in other markets as well. Uh, give me a second, be right back. Okay, this is a premium pair of panamagnetic headphones from a brand called Hi-Fi Man. I have the entire setup downstairs uh, with amplifier and deck. All of them are made from Chinese brand, from China. The performance of this thing can compete with European and American brands twice, if not three times of the price, okay? And this is not a cheap headphone, okay? This is a $1,300 pair of headphones. And I know 99% of my audience will not spend anything close to this much on a headphone. Not to say the equipment downstairs that drive this thing is even more expensive, but there are headphones that are three times, four times the price, you know, in three, four thousand area, five thousand. And this one can match those in terms of performance, okay? And this Chinese brand make many headphones starting from $99 all the way up to 6,000, maybe even more. And no matter what price range you're looking at, Hi-Fi Man is the performance benchmark of that particular price range. And surpassing traditional brands like uh, Sennheiser from Germany. And this is not me uh, being biased towards Chinese made products, okay? I brought many different headphones and amplifier and deck, and I mix and match them. A few of them cost even more than three, four thousand dollars and I end up kidding keeping only the Chinese ones. And they're not expensive. They're like five, six hundred dollars, the amplifier and the deck. And their performance match with those, you know, two thousand or three thousand dollar amp and deck. And I can't really tell a difference. So I just keep doing them instead. And this is just in one product type, in one industry. Okay. This is happening across many industry, across the entire sector. Okay, at the end, international trade is very complicated topic, um, but let me try to make it simple for my audience, okay? Europeans need to ask yourself, do you need to trade with other regions around the world to maintain a higher standard of living? That shouldn't be a hard question. <laughs> it's a definite yes, right? If you want something, let's say not from China, ignore China for now, but 
from elsewhere. Electronics from Japan, South Korea, clothing from Southeast Asia, or minerals from Africa, agricultural good from South America, those kind of things. What will you offer to those countries in return? What can you offer to them that China cannot at a much lower price point of pretty much the same thing? Tariff only helps temporarily, okay? The mechanic of these tariffs is supposed to buy European companies time to catch up to China in this scenario. If Europe doesn't come up with strategy in the long run, then tariff is both bad in the short term and bad in the long term. And obviously, this is not the only problem. Uh, you have an ongoing war right now in Europe, which drain resources that supposedly can go to industrial sector to improve efficiency. You also cut off cheap Russian energy, so your products will be either more expensive to produce or, or you have to work extra long hours and be more innovative in order to offset that expensive energy cost right now. And also you have to come up with all those improvements and alternatives while US is muddling your politics and try to cut you off from Chinese imports as well. <laughs> Just like they use Ukraine war to cut off, you know, Russian energy from you in order to contain China and weaken Russia. So all these things are inflationary and will create social unrest. So from my point of view, the big picture is not that good, okay? Of course, the whole picture is much more complicated. Uh, feel free to ask me uh, questions because I'm an industrial consultant. I've been doing business more in Europe than in US. So I know Europe quite well. For example, I used to work with Finnish people and every summer they go to Lapland to take a vacation. Everyone basically from the employer to the employee and you can't find them. There's not even cell phone signals there. There's no internet. You can't reach them for a month. They, they rotate, of course, not the entire company evacuate or like anything like that. But still, it's very difficult when you try to make adjustment, try to ask them to, you know, produce more in order to meet the market. And it's over like a three month period. All of them take, you know, months of vacation. And it's very difficult to do business with them and try to stay proactive. I'm going to try to make some long form contents in the future about this topic. And for my non Chinese audience who do not have access to Chinese contents until I translate them or someone else do so, you'll best bet to get more understanding of these is from, for example, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, he always talk about Western dominance and colonialism and how that is coming to an end. Also, Michael Hassan and Richard Wolf, I think, on trade balance and uneven economic developments. You can get some understanding of that as well. And also from, I think many people watched his video, Red Dalio, the economic system and global trend. You can get those. But again, to me, that's just the surface, okay? Those people that I just mentioned, they do not have on the ground experience working in China. So they are all missing the details that make China unique compared to other developing countries. And you have to be very intelligent in order to glue the whole picture together, which I find extremely difficult if you have little or no experience working in China. And trust me, this has a huge impact on geopolitics today, okay? Uh, again, if you have any question, let me know. See you guys in the next video.